In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lady Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Father Bernal and Terry, pray for us. St. Nasha Loyola, St. Martin, all God's angels and saints. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So I'll explain uh, where we're heading. And then uh, this evening, I'll ask you to be a little bit patient because the first night we have to cover a lot of material. So what I'll do is I'll give you and we'll be giving you about a 40, 45 minutes conference, then we'll have a short break, then we'll be a second conference, and then after that uh, we'll be able to break up into our groups and we'll be able to give you the handouts that you're going to be meditating upon uh, this, uh, this first week. So the, the first day of the exercises, uh, some of you have done the exercise with me, it's just a little bit longer and then starting next week, you'll just get one lecture and then that'll be it. Okay, so um, I'll ask for your patience tonight, but I'll try, to do, I'll try to do it as quickly as possible so that you don't get back really too late at night to be with your families. Okay, the first conference I give is I try to give you, uh, and I can't do justice in this, I, I have to give you a brief biological sketch of St. Ignatius. Okay, then we'll have a short break and the second conference will be on how to pray. I'm going to give you some tools on how to do your meditation and also I'll be giving you a brief talk on principle and foundation. So that's the menu tonight, okay? Um, can, you, can you all hear me well? So you in the back said, what? Okay. <laughs> Boys, uh, the problem with, is with the microphone. There was a new pastor that started out the mass and he, he was really fumbling with the microphone and he said, he said with the microphone, <clears throat> there's something wrong with his microphone that people said, and also with you. <laughs> And there's a story of this priest that said, all of you who want to be saved, sit down. So there was like three people in the back. There was a man standing up in the back and the priest said, why are you standing up? He said, Father, I don't, I don't want you to be alone. <laughs> Here's a question for you. What does ASAP stand for? I didn't hear you. Uh, uh, always say a prayer. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're aiming at. Uh, it's not as soon as possible, but always say a prayer. Okay, St. Ignatius. Uh, St. Ignatius, um, the first uh, eight or nine minutes, I have to give you a mini course in church history. This is not a, cor a course in church history, but if I don't do this, you don't, you're not going to understand Ignatius nor the thrust of these exercises. Okay, St. Ignatius uh, was born in Spain. Okay? He was born in 1491, and he died 400 years before I was born, so I feel honored. 
1556. 56 is a good year, right? <laughs> so he uh, was living in that in that uh, context of the 15th century and the 16th century. Okay, to understand uh, Ignatius, you have to understand the certain events that were going on when he was living. Okay, first of all, I'm going to throw out persons and events, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Henry VIII. Henry VIII. You've heard of him, right? Basically destroyed the Catholic faith in, in England, where my ancestors come from many years ago. Hmm? Destroyed the Catholic faith in England. Hmm? Have you heard of Martin Luther? Yes. Not Martin Luther King. Okay? <laughs> but Martin Luther lived at the same time. Who was he? He was an Augustinian priest. But he caused many problems within in the church. He started what is called the Protestant Reformation in Germany. Have you ever heard of John Calvin? He lived at the same time. So Luther started it and Calvin finished it. Luther had a certain theological mind, but he was scattered, kind of a scatterbrain, whereas Calvin was very systematic, very methodical. So he organized Protestantism. And then we have also, so you see the church is going through a great turmoil. The church is going through one of the most difficult times in the history there in that, that, that uh, 16th century. Also, you had probably the most famous naval battle in the history of the Catholic Church. It's called the Battle of Lepanto. Have any of you heard that? It was a naval battle between the Muslims and the Catholics. And Pope Pius V told the Catholics to pray the rosary because the Muslims had by far the strongest navy in the world, by far. The Catholics, in comparison to them, they were a rinky-dink navy. But as a result of the rosary that thousands of Catholics were praying in Rome and Italy and in Europe, that uh, the tide changed and the Catholics won the battle. <clears throat> so you see the church was being rent asunder within, but also the church was being attacked from without. So let me ask you a question. Uh, is the church going through a tough time now? No. How about the family? No. How about the school system? No. How about politics? No. We've never lived We've never lived in a more difficult time in the history of the world as right now. How many parents here? I'm fearful for your children. And I'm not a pessimist. For your children, I'm fearful. As a priest, I'm involved in everything. I, I teach catechism, I teach confirmation, I teach the Hispanics, I write articles, I try to do as much as I can. I have contact with many people, but I have contact with a lot of teenagers. It's tough. Well, the parents want to send them to me, okay? Send them to Padre Escobita. <laughs> uh, but it's tough. So we're going through the most difficult time in the history of the world. So what happened, at the same time that Ignatius is living, God is going to raise up some of the greatest saints in the history of Catholicism. Can I mention them? Say yes, Father. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Teresa of Avila, lives, living at the same time. 
You've heard of her, right? Her spiritual director, John of the Cross. She had three spiritual directors that were canonized saints. John of the Cross, who else? St. Peter Alcantara, and who else? St. Francis Borgia. They're all living at the same time. St. John of Avila, who Pope Francis named as the new doctor of the church about a year and a half ago. So here you have some of the, the greatest, uh, some of the greatest luminaries or stars in the firmament of heaven are living at the same time that you've got this spiritual torment. That's just in Spain. Let's go to Italy. Pray for the bishops today because back then you had one, without a doubt, one of the greatest bishops in the history of the Catholic Church. His name was, of course, Saint Charles Borromeo. who was the son of the mother who was among the most richest people in the world. It's called the Medici family. Okay? Charles Borbain, he's living at that same time. The second apostle of Rome, who would that be? St. Philip Neri. A canonized pope, St. Pius V. They're all living at the same time. But let's check your history. Ignatius 1491 to 1556. What happened in the year 1531? No hay mexicanos aquí? No hay mexicanos aquí? A la Virgen de Guadalupe! Que vive la Virgen de Guadalupe! Huh? Yeah. Yes. Ignatius of Loyola is 40 years old when our lady Guadalupe appears to Juan Diaguito, right? So you've got, we might say, one of the most difficult times in church history, but God is raising up super saints. Once again, he asks you the question, are we going through tough times? Yes. There's only one solution. Are you listening? There's only one solution is that every one of you, every one of you here has to become a great saint. Amen? Amen. I don't, I don't say that as a pious platitude or a cliche, but rather I say it in truth. You have to be the Latter-day Saints. Maybe I shouldn't have said that, huh? <laughs> You'll laugh at that, but St. Louis de Montfort, maybe heard St. Louis de Montfort said the Latter-day Saints would be those who love Mary most, they will carry the cross in one hand, the rosary in the other hand, the names of Jesus and Mary inscribed in their hearts. Amen. 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 St. Louis de Montfort, true devotion. So that's the historical framework of the, of the time in which Ignatius lived. So let's, let's talk now about the, the person of Ignatius. When you were little kids, maybe your mom had you read the lives of the saints like Dominic Savio or some, when you were a little child, at least that's the way it used to be 50 years ago. I thought when I was a kid that saints were born saints. I thought that they lived in another, another spiritual milieu. I thought that they were perfect. I thought that they didn't even have to go to the bathroom. I mean, I just thought <laughs> they're just, just different, no? But then in time, I recognized that I grew older and decided to read other saints like Augustine and other saints, that the saints are not born saints. They're born sinners. And that's the case of Ignatius. Ignatius 
Augustine, Mary Magdalene, Margaret of Cortona, um, uh, Saint Camille de Lelis. You got these saints that lived kind of kind of wild lives. And that was the case of Ignatius. He was born in Spain of a really big family. Uh, but he, he lived a really worldly life. And by profession, he was a soldier. He spent some time in the, in the royal court as a page. But by profession, he was a soldier. And autobiography... Biographies of Ignatius say he, pr he probably broke all the commandments. Possibly even had a, 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 a illegitimate child like Augustine. But he was pretty wild. He was strong-willed. He was a womanizer. He liked to drink. He liked to fight. He liked to duel with the sword. I mean, he was a, he was a tough guy. I think he would scare the cholas of Hawaiian Gardens. I, I think he would. No? <laughs> You ever hear of the gardens, huh? I'm from the gardens, huh? I mean, he was a tough guy. But God intervened with what is, I like language, and you're going to like this expression, with a providential accident, huh? Yeah. A providential accident. How did it happen? Okay, in this talk, I like to almost compare it to Charles Dickens, not the tale of two cities, but the tale of seven cities. Hmm? Ignatius was born in Loyola, but his conversion took place in this way. He was winning many battles, he was becoming somewhat famous as a soldier. He was highly respected because of his courage, a valiant soldier. So he's winning battle after battle after battle. And then he's got to confront the French. And the French army that he has to confront is much more powerful than him. I mean, than, than his, his, uh, his army. And the soldiers told him, hey, look, we, we, can't, we, can't, we can't beat these, uh, these, th this army. They're, they've got more cannons, they got more artillery, they got more soldiers, they got more horses. Uh, this, uh, it's just impossible. Ignatius said, we'll, we'll win the battle. Now, if some of you have seen the film of Ignatius made in the Philippines, which came out about three years ago, of Ignatius Loyola, I recommend that you see it. You can see what happened. It was in the city of Pamplona. Try to remember that. Pamplona. So there Ignatius is. He's in the fortress defending the fortress of Pamplona and the French are approaching with their soldiers, their horses, their artillery, their cannons, their rifles. And all of a sudden you see him there fighting and they shoot a cannonball and it crashes right through the wall and it goes right at Ignatius. But it went, guess where, at his legs. And it was not bow-legged Ignatius, okay? It went right at his legs and it basically des destroyed one leg and the other one was shattered. So there he is, laying there half dead with both of his legs almost ruined. So he's taken off the battlefield, and the French, they really admired his courage. And they take him back to Loyola. Now there he is in Loyola, and the doctors look at him, and they say, look, you know, your legs, you, you, gotta, you have to be operated on. So without anesthesia, this is 500 years ago, they had to break his leg. 
Then they had to break his leg again. Then Ignatius, who was very vain, he didn't want to walk with a limp. He was a woman's man. He didn't want to him see him walking with a limp. That was kind of embarrassing. So he noticed that there was a, a bone protrusion. So in other words, a bone was jutting out beneath his knee. And he told the doctors, are you listening? Saw it off without anesthesia. His brother almost fainted, saw it off. So Ignatius, he clenched his fist and they sawed the bone off. What, an, uh, what, a, what, a, what a will of iron, huh? What a man, huh? We hear that, we almost faint. I say that not to scare you away, but to show you the, the real willpower that this guy had. And I maintain that all of you have willpower, but I think we dissipate a lot of our energy on things that are kind of superficial, kind of mediocre, things that are really not profiting our spiritual life the way they should in our life is very short. Because we're going to see once he's converted, he's going to be expending every ounce of his energy to praise God and to save souls. And that's going to happen to all of you, I hope, within 10 weeks. Amen? Amen. Okay, another element of his conversion is this. How many people in this church right now know how to read? <laughs> okay, how many people knew how to read 500 years ago? You got the invention of the printing press. This was before the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. So the society in Europe was basically agrarian. So couples would just have to marry, have 15 to 20, 10, 20 kids and, that, and take care of the farm. They didn't have to read and write. But Ignatius, as well as Teresa of Avila, they knew how to read and how to write. But there's a problem. What did they like to read? Las telenovelas. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they read that type of pulp, sensual, mundane, romantic literature, which maybe it wasn't downright sinful, but it was very, very superficial. Very superficial. So Ignatius had this long time of, of convalescence, and he asked uh, one of his relatives to bring him some books to read, pass the time. So his sister-in-law brings him, not Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, but rather brings him the lives of the saints. Uh, it's the last thing he wanted to read. But given that he had all this free time, this is what happened. He spent long hours imagining the discourse that he was going to say to the beautiful queen to ask for her hand so that one day he'd marry the beautiful queen and be Mr. Famous. So he'd spend hours upon hours with his vivid imagination, imagining him eventually marrying the beautiful queen and becoming one of the most famous men in the world. Now when he did that, he experienced pleasure on the surface of his soul. But after he finished, here's a key word that all of us are going to learn in these 10 weeks. He fell into a profound state of desolation. You ever hear that word? Desolation. What's that? Sadness. Discouragement. Life doesn't really have any meaning. But then, what happened? He started to read the lives of the saints. 
And as you read the lives of saints, the exact opposite happens, happened. It's like a fire exploded in his soul. And he said, if Francis did it, I will do it. If Dominic did it, I will do it. If Augustine did it, I will do it. If the Desert Fathers could do it, I will do it. So reading the lives of saints, his heart was set on fire to become a great saint and to attain heaven. Then after this happened for a while, his eyes were opened a little bit and he recognizes some things, activities bring us to desolation and others bring us to consolation. And from that, we have what? The famous rules for discernment. The art of spiritual discernment, which you're going to be learning in these 10 weeks. Because all of you, you know, there are certain things that bring you to desolation. There are other things that bring you to consolation. You have to be aware of that. And not only aware of it, but what do you do when you're in desolation? What do you not do? Because if you do not know how to act in desolation, it can wreak havoc within your life. How many young people commit suicide today because they're in a profound cloud of desolation? Many today. So these rules of desolation and consolation, the art of spirit of discernment, is necessary today more than ever. And that's part of these exercises. Okay, so eventually uh, he's battling with his health. His health really declines. St. Peter appears to him and he rebounds. And his health is good enough so that he can move on his way as a pilgrim. So the next place where Ignatius is going in our tale of the seven cities would be to a sanctuary in Montserrat. Okay, Montserrat. Montserrat, back in the 1600s, 16th century, still there, there was a Benedictine Marian monastery. And Ignatius wanted to go there on pilgrimage to visit the Blessed Virgin Mary. So as he's heading there on his mule, he's traveling by mule, he bumps into a Muslim. And they start to talk. They have a theological debate. And it surfaces the topic of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And they're talking about one of Mary's privileges. It's called her perpetual virginity. That Mary was virgin before the birth of Christ, during the birth and after. And the Muslim says, that's nonsense. Ignatius gets so angry inside that he's traveling on his mule. They arrive at a, a fork in the road and he makes this decision. If my mule follows him to the right, I will kill him and honor Mary. But if my mule goes the other direction toward Montserrat, he'll be safe. Thanks be to God that the mule was a Catholic mule. <laughs> it was a Catholic mule. So he arrives at Montserrat. In Montserrat, what's happening there? Right now, Ignatius is going deeper and deeper into a life of conversion. He's really fervent. He's on fire. He's got, a, he's got a real passion for Christ. But he's still very immature. This is what he's doing in Montserrat. He's spending a lot of time in silence. He's going to Mass. He's practicing a lot of penance and fasting. He's spending long hours in prayer. He's consulting a lot of priests. He's seeking out spiritual direction. But the key element in Montserrat is the following. Up to this point, Ignatius has gone through a conversion, but he's committed 
many, many sins. And his conscience is weighed down by sin. Weighed down by sin. So what he does is he does a very thorough and deep examination of conscience. It takes him a long time. He's rewinding the film of his life and he's seeing all the time that he's offended his, his majesty. Then after he finishes his examination of conscience, he finds a priest and asks the priest if he can go to confession. The priest says, of course. So he goes to confession and his confession took in between four and five days. Four and five days. The, the priest that heard his confession was so impressed at the, at the depths of the soul of this individual, of the delicacy of his conscience, of the fact that he knew not only sins, but the inner movements of his heart the different motivations that moved him in that direction. And the priest was just blown away by this kind of eccentric stranger that walked with a limp that seemed to be kind of a crazy, wild guy, but a man who seemed to be, have his heart on fire with the love of God now. Okay, let's make a practical application. You people are called to become great saints you have to purify your conscience. You have to. You have to purify your conscience. I think a lot of people are blocked in this spiritual life because they live with, can I say it, with unconfessed sin? Can I say it? Yeah. And that's a detour in the spiritual life. Part of the spiritual life is transparency, is childlike simplicity, is purity, is purity of mind, body, heart, intention. <clears throat> so we're entering into this very night, we're entering into 10 weeks of retreat. One thing you're gonna be encountering is a fire, fire. What does a fire do? It burns. Who's, who, 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 the Holy Spirit is fire. He's fire. He wants to burn away all the dross, all the impurities within our, our whole being, as it happened with Ignatius. Allow the flames of God, God's love to purify your heart, your mind, your soul, your whole being. Amen? Don't be afraid. As the book of Hebrews says, our God is a devouring fire. So that's, okay, that's another stage of his life. So we move where Loyola, Pamplona, Pamplona, Montserrat, Montserrat. He moves to Manresa. Manresa, which is about a mile away. And on Manresa, there was a cave. Now, when Ignatius was there in Manresa, he was spending about seven hours of prayer every day, seven to eight hours of prayer, prayer every day, and then he was spending time in apostolic work, where he was visiting the sick, uh, he was helping out the poor. But in Montserrat, he experienced great consolation. In Manresa, he experienced great desolation. And the reason being is he was about to receive one of the greatest mystical experiences in the history of Catholicism. So the devil was attacking him. The devil was attacking him. 
In your spiritual life, you're, you're, as you get older, this is going to happen to you sooner or later. It always happens to me. You know? Before a major victory, the devil places a lot of roadblocks. You'll understand when you're growing your spiritual life. You know? Before a major victory, you have obstacles within and without. Ever happened? Hello? So, so that's a good sign. It's actually a good sign that the devil knows that God's going to use you to save souls and all hell breaks loose. One of the temptations is going to be the following. Is some of you are going to be tempted not to persevere in your exercises these 10 weeks. Can I ask you a favor? Can I? Okay, one week from today is going to be my birthday, okay? Can you give me a birthday present? Can you? Okay, I want to see every one of you here in 10 weeks, okay? That's the only birthday present I want. I want all of you to persevere. You know, I can give me the birthday present. Persevere. 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 Hang in there. Now, the only way you're going to learn how to pray is you have to, you have to persevere. You're going to go through, you're going to be tempted. This week, oh, you know, that father room, he's kind of a fanatic. Come on, let's, let's, let's move on, no? Isn't Chief Lado? Come on, let's move on, no? Okay, you're going to be, you're going to be tempted, you're going to be tempted to give up. Because if you do these exercises well, I promise you, it's going to have a radical change in your life. And the devil does not want that. The devil wants all of you to be mediocre. You know what that is? Ever hear the word mediocre? The devil wants nice, good, comfortable, mediocre Catholics. The Holy Spirit wants fire. Catholics that are on fire. So don't forget, I'm asking you for my birthday present, okay? So let's move on. So when he's in Manresa, he is being tormented by the devil with what is called scrupulosity. Ever hear that word? Scrupulosity. Scrupulosity manifests itself in many ways, but in his case, it was this. The devil was attacking him with these thoughts. You went to confession, it wasn't a good confession. You didn't confess all the sins. You weren't really sorry. You're kind of a hypocrite. So he was being he was being rifled, riveted with these thoughts. And his saving grace was he would go and open up and talk to a priest. Never forget that when you're going through desolation, you have to learn how to open up your conscience and talk to a spiritual director. You hear me? That's Ignatius. You can't do it by yourself. You can't. And the deeper you go in your spiritual life, the more subtle is the devil. The more subtle is temptations when you start to advance. But the devil, the devil works hard to convince us that what we're doing spiritually is just a waste of time. Yep. It's just a waste of time. So the temptation got stronger and stronger. He kept opening up to the priest. He decided to fast. So he fasted a whole week without eating anything. Temptation didn't go away. He goes to the priest and said, I fasted a week. I'm going to fast another week. And the priest said, no, start to eat. So he obeyed his director. He started to eat. The temptation disappeared. Learn how to obey. Amen? Learn how to obey. If you're an obedient soul, God is going to use you to do great things. But if we're not obedient, we're proud. God drops us like a hot potato. <laughs> he does. 
Okay. Now, what happens in the midst of this turmoil is this. He's praying in the cave of Manresa, and the Blessed Virgin Mary appears to him when he's in prayer, and Mary gives him the spiritual exercises that you're going to be doing. You'll see pictures, paintings of, of Ignatius is kneeling down with a pen, and the Blessed Virgin Mary is there, and Mary is dictating to him and is writing down the spiritual exercises. So these spiritual exercises came from the heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Amen? Amen. You happy about that? Yes. I'm an oblate of the Virgin Mary. I'm more happy than you. <laughs> Anything that has Mary's presence I, that fills me with joy. Amen? Amen? Okay, so he finishes his time in Manresa. Then he moves on to another place. He wanted now to go and spend the rest of his life in Jerusalem. Why? Because it's called the Fifth Gospel, if you've ever made a pilgrimage there, to visit the places where Jesus was born, where Jesus walked the earth, where Jesus worked miracles, where Jesus walked on water, where Jesus raised the dead, where Jesus shed his blood, where Jesus rose from the dead. He just wanted to be where Jesus was. But many obstacles. Finally, when he's able to cross over, in less than three weeks, a Franciscan priest, because the Holy Land is under the custodian of the Franciscans, comes up to him and says, go back to Europe. He said, I'm not going to go back to Europe. Go back. I'm going to stay right here. And then the Franciscan priest, if you don't go back, I've got a document here of your excommunication from the Catholic Church. Why? Because the Muslims were killing Christians back 500 years ago. So to save these pilgrims from being killed, so Ignatius obeyed. Then he goes back to Europe and he goes back to Spain. And what he's doing now is he's giving the spiritual exercises. Now, the spiritual exercises, the original pristine spiritual exercises is not what I'm giving you here. What you have is what I wrote out about 13 years ago. It's called Annotation 19. Annotation 19 is what? It's the principle of adaptation. The original exercises was one-on-one. -on -one. Ignatius was the director. He would see if an individual could, could pray for a month <laughs> to see if the person was, was physically, emotionally, morally, socially able. Well, a month is a long time. And then he would direct him one at a time. And as a result of this, you had farmers and doctors and lawyers and priests and bishops that were doing the exercise with Ignatius and in one month, radically transformed. In one month. One month, this firm desire to become a great saint. Some of you have heard of the Spanish Inquisition. That was out there. Spanish Inquisition, what was that? There was a lot of, a lot of errors that were being disseminated in Europe. So they cracked down on possible pseudo or false theologians or false mystics. So they see this kind of weird guy walking with a limp, given these exercises, and they approach him, the ecclesiastics, and say, what the heck are you doing? Who are you? You're giving these exercises. Are you a bishop? No. Are you a priest? No. Are you a deacon? No. Are you a subdeacon? No. Are you an altar boy? No. <laughs> it's 
So they said, hey, stop it. You have no authority to give those exercises. So he kind of brushed them aside, and they ended up throwing him in jail. Then he got out of jail, and he started to give the exercises again. They threw him in jail again. So after being thrown in jail more than once, it dawned on him, he's already heading toward you know, 30 years, 30 years of age, late 20s. The guy's got four years of education. I didn't even finish elementary school. So he recognizes, hey, I gotta go back to school. So he goes back to a primary school in a city called Barcelona. And then after Barcelona, he moves on to Alcala to finish his high school. Then he goes and studied a little bit in Salamanca. But he wanted to go on and to get his doctorate, his degree in philosophy. And he wanted to do it in the best place. And if you know what, what was the best university back in the 16th century? What would be the Harvard, the Princeton, the Yale, or the Oxford, or the Cambridge? University of Paris, okay? where Thomas Aquinas had taught earlier and Albert the Great, that was the number one, okay? And maybe after that, University of Padua, but Paris was, the, that would be the Harvard or the, or the Yale, okay? So he ends up there. And what's happening now, these young men are just so impressed with the holiness of this kind of weird guy, and he's given the exercises to these men and they are on fire with the love of God. So he ends up at the university, and he doesn't have enough money to pay for his lodging, so he has to, he has to room with two other men. The two other men are much younger than him. And Ignatius, Ignatius was not an intellectual, like Aquinas, like Augustine, like John Paul II, like, Pius the Twelfth. He wasn't intellectual, or like St. Alphonsus. Okay? Uh, so he's there, the, and he's kind of struggling with his studies, and he's got two roommates that are much younger, and they're talking a lot together, and one of them, one of them had a lot of emotional problems. He was an introvert, he was fearful, insecure, had a lot of hang-ups, a lot of phobias, a lot of doubts, a lot of confusion, very melancholic, kind of like a, a ball of confusion. However, he was also a genius. Can happen, no? A genius with a photographic memory. <laughs> and Ignatius took him through the exercises and he went on to become the greatest master of giving the exercises in the world after St. Ignatius. And the Pope canonized him two years ago. Can they tell you his name? Saint-Pierre Favre. How's your French? Hmm? Saint-Pierre Favre. St. Peter Faber. He became the greatest expert as a result of the exercises. Now his other roommate was the exact opposite. He was an extrovert. He was a party animal. You know what that is? He liked to eat, he liked to dance, he liked parties, he liked the fiesta, la pechanga. I mean, he just loved to... <laughs> he, 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 he loved to live it up. And also, if he were living today, he would win the gold medal in the high jump. So he was probably the best athlete in the university. Which is usually not the case. Usually when you have an intellectual, it doesn't tend to be so much of an athlete. But this guy had all these talents. He was a linguist. He was an athlete. He, had a, he was a genius like the other guy. So Ignatius approaches him and says, I would like you to do the exercises. Get out, get out of here. Come on, do the exercises. Nope. Then Nasus went after him because he was thinking, if this man is converted, 
This man has got so many talents. Did you ever hear what Thomas Aquinas says, grace does not destroy nature but builds on it? You ever hear that? Hmm? Grace does not destroy nature but builds on it. He's got this solid human intellectual, human formation. If this guy is converted, wow, the sky's the limits. So he graduates, gets his doctorate in philosophy, and he's teaching philosophy, runs out of money, and Ignatius gives him money. Ignatius sends students to his classes. He's going to try to get this man to do the exercises. So finally, finally, after Ignatius is going after him, pursuing him like the insistent widow of the Bible, he says, what do you want of me? I want you to do the exercises. I want you to do the exercises. Okay, I'll do the exercises. So Ignatius took him through the exercises, and Ignatius said that this was the hardest nut to crack. This guy was hard to crack, but he did the exercises and was converted. So after that, Ignatius with these two men, and other five of them, they go to Montmartre and they make vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience giving themselves to the service of God through Mary. Then they go to Rome and they present themselves to Pope Paul III and say, we want to form an order. And the Pope gives permission and the Pope blesses them and you have the formation of an order that in Spanish is called La Compañía de Jesús. You ever hear them? La Compañía de Jesús, did you ever hear the Jesuits? So there you have the foundation of the Jesuits. And Ignatius offers to the church four vows, poverty, chastity, obedience, and then one other vow, which was obedience to the Pope to do whatever the Pope wanted. He would be always available to the service of the Pope. That Pope had a great missionary desire to get out of Europe. Europe was already evangelized, but he had to go, want to send them to the Far East. So he turns to Ignatius and said, can you give me a couple of priests to go to the Far East? Ignatius says, yes, take these two, two, of, my, two of my priests. They both got sick. So he turns to his friend, the cocky guy that made the exercises, who is now his best friend and secretary. He said, will you go? I will obey. Ignatius sends him off and he says these words to him, go set all on fire. Go set all on fire. So he embarks from Portugal, ends up in the country of India, in the place called Goa, G-O-A and he's preaching and teaching and baptizing and converting hundreds and thousands of souls. Then he goes from Goa to India to Indonesia, to Malaysia, converting so many souls, this one guy. And he says, I've got to go to another place. He ends up in Japan and he's converting hundreds of Japanese. Then he had an idea. What's the best way to convert the Japanese? Convert the Chinese, yeah. <laughs> because the Japanese admire the Chinese. So there he was overlooking mainland China. He's about to dive in there to swim to China. He gets this high fever and he gets sick. And at 46 years old, he dies after converting thousands and thousands and thousands of souls in the name of that man was the great Saint Francis Xavier. The greatest missionary in the Catholic Church after Saint Paul. So I've told you my friends the story of three saints. Saint Ignatius, Saint Peter Fabra, and Saint Francis Xavier. 
And it all came about as a result of them doing the spiritual exercises. They did the exercises in one month. You're going to be doing the exercises in 10 weeks. If you do the exercises well, all of you can become great saints. Amen? Amen. So we're going to take a, about a five minute break, as I said, and then I'll give you the second lecture and then we'll be able to divide into groups and receive your material. So you can stretch, you have to go to the bathroom. So in about five to seven minutes we'll start the second conference.